Uh, good afternoon, uh, all distinguished guests. Uh, first up, I would like to thank you for the organizer to inv invite me in this meeting because this meeting is very excellent. Uh, we don't need to spare a lot, a, lot, a lot of time. Just stay here and then we can get a very good speaker here. The best in the world speaker is all here. So, uh, the next speaker will be uh, Professor Henry. Professor Henry is a graduate uh, from the. Uh, Professor Henry has been a leading figure of endoscopic neurosurgery and skull based neurosurgery of the past year. And now he is the chairman of the Neuroendoscopic Committee of the WFMS. Uh, Dr. Henry, especially, is uh, like a. Uh, a little bit young, but it is good. <laughs> so he can also he can teach our students very well. So now that they have this open a lot of uh, uh, young surgeons go to this department to learn with him about the endoscopic surgery. But I like to emphasize before we learn the endoscopic surgery, it's better if we have the basic of the open surgery, uh, especially in the, in the skull surgery. So this time we will have a definitely here. Ni hao. It's a great pleasure to be again in China. Thank you for the nice introduction. I want to thank INC for organizing this nice meeting and I want to thank Helwood for bringing me to this group. Uh, we had a lot of uh, discussions already and we have heard the opinions of many of us and about microsurgery and endoscope and Tucker is a good guy to discuss about microneurosurgery and endoscopy. So I am happy what he will uh, comment. So I want to talk about Craniopharyngiomas. Craniopharyngiomas, the strategy for me has been changing a lot in the recent years, especially since the introduction of HD cameras. So there's a lot of uh, discussion still, what is the best approach for craniopharyngiomas? It is microsurgery, and there are a lot of transgenic approaches, and all of these I have tried. And always we had the problem that we have to dissect through the windows, in between the optic nerves, lateral to the optic nerve, optocarotid window, retrocarotid window, transfemia terminalis, so always you have the neurovascular structures in front of you. So, since the tumors are below these structures, it makes sense to come from below. This was one case I did many years ago. You see, this is supracellar lesion, and this is a prefix chiasm. So, this is a chiasm. You see that here, so there's no space when you open you see skull base and just the optic nerve. We make a terrional approach, which was standard at that time. And what we see, just optic chiasm, carotid, so we had to dissect in the retrocarotid window. We created a window between optic nerve and carotid, a lot of dissection. And finally, the patient ended up with a new visual field deficit. So then, of course, endonasal is nice. Tucker has said, Microsurgery can be done for these, this is correct, for small lesions, you can also make an extended approach. But the endoscope gives you the advantage that you have this wide angle view. You have a perfect illumination, you have a magnification, and that's why the view is better in the endonasal approach with an endoscope. That, that is a view with a microscope, you know that this is the margin of the speculum. And you have only this limited field of view, you just see the floor of the cellar. We have the same patient and remove the speculum and take a zero degree endoscope, you have this image. And you see, because of this wide angle of view, you have a better orientation. You see the carotid, you see the optic nerve, clival carotid, 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 clinoidal carotid, so everything is in your view, so it's very safe to dissect. The microscope, you were not sure is it really corroded, was a blind curettage, and this was, of course, more dangerous. And I think a major step forward is the video technology, HD. Now we have 4K, the resolution is perfect. Before, I think Dr. Fukushima was right. Microsurgery was better because the resolution of the endoscope was very poor. But now, since we have HD since 2007, I think there's no need to use a microscope for these approaches. And the benefit of the endoscopic approach for craniofarin is that you very early identify the stalk. You just uh, pose the pituitary glands, you cut the diaphragm, and then you will find 
very easily where's the stalk. In microsurgery, sometimes you see it only at the end of the surgery. The second thing is, you see the branches of the superior hypophysal arteries, which are so important to preserve a good visual function. Of course, the problem is closure. Sebastian mentioned for, uh, for chordomas. Thank you for a little bit better, but still you have high CSF leakage, so the nasal septal flap should be created. And what, in my opinion, is very important to use a reverse flap. A reverse flap means you take the mucosa from the congolateral side and reflect it over the denuded, denuded septum where you took the flap from. And then you have a very early revascularization and the postoperative discomfort for the patient with discharge and crusting is uh, reduced <coughs> tremendously. So when we deal with craniform germans, the main question is, should we aim for gross total resection? And this uh, ha depends on many factors. The first factor is the aim of the surgery. Do you really want from the beginning to have a total resection? <coughs> is there hypothalamic infiltration? And you know if the patient presents already with hypothalamic signs, sometimes it's ill-advised Ill -advised to make a total resection. You see here, around this craniform germans, you see uh, edema around the lesion the hypothalamus, so you know there must be an infiltration and you should be more reluctant with this. Other factors are memory body infiltration, stalk infiltration, and is there a um, presence of hydrocephalus. So, should we sacrifice the stalk? So I think everybody of you is agreeing if there is hypothalamic invasion, and you have not a good plane, you should not force for total resection because this will devastates the patient. But if just the stalk is a problem with infiltration, then still the question is should we sacrifice this or not? And there are interesting opinions in the literature. This is a recent paper from a Schwartz group in New York, and they found even if they preserve the stalk, they have around 50% of his patients who are panhypo pit. That's why he raised the question, should we preserve the stalk? Yes or no? And there is a comment of Oldfield, and he said, if the stalk infiltration is the only reason which pretends or which avoids um, total resection, then he advocates resection of the stalk because with medical treatment all these deficits can be compensated. But of course we have to consider where you are. I was in Bangladesh and then we made a cranial germa case and they said please don't take the stalk, you will kill the patient because he has no money, he goes back to his rural area, no, no support, so if this patient gets EI, no chance. So that depends also from the economic situation and in which environment you are working. And then there's a very interesting paper from a Japanese group, and they were very aggressive. They resect the tumor and even the floor of the third ventricle. And although they do that, they found that in 50% of their patients, they have no permanent DI. And that for me is very surprising because all my patients, when I cut the stalks, they have DI forever. So there is a nice classification uh, from the Kassam group of the craniofine jomas. The first type is in front of the stalk, pre-infundibular. Second one is within the stalk, trans-infundibular. And the third type is radial infundibular. And there's the fourth type that means purely intraventricular. So if you have a pre-infundibular craniofine joma, when you open, the dura by a trans tuberculum transparent approach. You see the optic nerve, optic nerve, and you see just you see just the tumor. No stalk visible, but you have the gland, so you open the diaphragm and you follow it, and then you find the stalk. So an example was a patient with a right visual deficit on the right eye, visual acuity was poor, and the chronological intact. If you see the pre-op MRI, you see a cystic supracellar lesion, but you don't know where it's the stalk exactly. So we make a trans tuberculum, transplantum approach. We open the bony floor of the cellar always, so I can push down the pituitary gland a bit to get another space. So we open the dura, and you see here is a cystic tumor already collapsed. So then we try to make bimanual dissection, not simply pulling, early identification of the stalk, which is behind the tumor. Then I use a lot of sharp dissection, so no pulling if possible. But I try to preserve all these small vessels of the superior hypophysal artery. It's a bimanual technique, so I push the tumor away with the suction, and then with the other instrument, I, I 
uh, dissect on this plane between the hypothalamus and the tumor. Again, sharp dissection here to release the tumor from the chiasm. And then again, you see by manual dissection, and this vessel is not a tumor vessel, it's just attached to the tumor, but it's supplying the infundibulum or the chiasm. So we try to preserve all these small branches to prevent any visual deficit. And only if the tumor is really circumferentially dissected, then we go on and, and take the tumor out. Sometimes you see videos of big forceps coming, just pulling. I think this is not a good idea, but we should dissect around the tumor, and then we can take the tumor out. And if you look in, you see nicely preserved stalk, pecom artery, and the chiasm, almost no damage. And this is a post-op MRI, two years later, no recurrence, no obesity of the patient, and then endocrinologically he's completely intact, so a good result. The type 2 are more difficult because they are within the infundibulum, so when you open up, you see the stalk, and within the stalk all is tumor. That means the stalk is very thin around the tumor. And then the question is, what should we do? Should we have the total resection or not? Usually we open on the side to decrease the cystic component. And you see inside there is a cyst and it's very adherent to the structures. You see this is all hypothalamus. If you try to dissect this cystic lesion from the stalk, the stalk is at least functionally destroyed. One example, 25 year, a 29 year old female who was brought by a his girlfriend, because she was not happy with her performance, and a neurological workup showed uh, pituitary insufficiency, and he has this lesion. You see, it's a midline lesion, but going far up to the fornices, and the sensitive view shows a big lesion filling all of the third ventricle. And then we discuss what is the best approach. Most people say this is clearly transcalosal. But if you look exactly, the longitudinal <coughs> axis of this tumor is this direction. And if you look here, this is a chiasm and this is a gland. So the distance between chiasm and gland is very important for the endonasal approach. But here we have plenty of space. That's why we said we make an endoscopic endonasal approach. Again, you see the pituitary gland is here, optic nerve left, optic nerve right. You see the arachnoid intact. First we dissect the arachnoid. And you see this is all stalk. The tumor is really within the stalk. So we have to open the stalk in the midline, try to preserve most of the vessels for the chiasm, and then we have to find the plane. So this is not the tumor capsule. All what is around here, this is all stalk. Ultrasonic aspiration is very nice because the tumor was not so calcified. You see, this is all the stalk. So we have to find the right plane. But we see the tumor sticky to the roof of the third ventricle. Do we need a 45 degree endoscope? This is impossible with a microscope. 45 degree endoscopes by manual dissection, traction, counter traction, and you see here is a gliotic plane around the tumor. So there's no direct um, hypothalamic tissue where you see the white structure. This is a yellowish gliotic plane. That's why I continued with the dissection, but by manual. And you see my forceps cannot reach the upper part. I had to bend my Fukushima suction to get up to the roof of the third ventricle. And then I could dissect completely around with this view on a 45 degree endoscope. And then I can take the tumor out from, from the cavity. You see it, cross total resection. And then we close it with fat fiber and blue flap and number drain for five days. After 10 days, you see post mortem MRI. Now 52 months later, no recurrence. Stalk is preserved. <coughs> But is it, is it working? No. He needs full supple supplement of tumors. Also, I preserved the stalk. It was not working well. It was hormone substitution. His girlfriend is heavy again. He did not gain weight. So it was a good, was a good result. Another patient. This was a 76-year-old female. Visual problems and a chronological completely intact. Comes with this cystic lesion here. So what we do? We open it. You see the stalk is here on the left side. We open the cyst, evacuate it, but then we looked. This, the stalk is completely involved in the cystic lesion. So if I take this tumor out, this lady will be 10 hypopic. 76 years. 
Should we do that? No, I think we should not do that. We just make a decompression and we left the tumor aside along the stalk. Then we tend to for fractionated stereotactic radial therapy, 54 grains, and she is now 52 months after surgery, no recurrence, and she does not require any substitution so far. So I think in older patient, the subtotal resection is a good alternative. Type 3 is a retroinfluent tumor, that means we see the stock, initially the tumor is behind. One example, the problem was on the right eye again, you see the lesion, cystic lesion, suprastellar area, tumor went close into the direction of the third ventricle. So we expose it, the stalk is easily identified because the tumor is behind the stalk, and then we dissect again by manual dissection, takes the tumor, dissect, you see here is a branch of the superficial artery attached to the tumor capsule, by manual dissection, carefully preservation of these vessels, and then again, we are looking for a plane between the tumor and the hypothalamus. And in this patient, we find a good plane, dissected by manually, takes a solid tumor part out. And then again, we dissect the, the cystic tumor part by manual dissection, sharp dissection, so not simply pulling. And then we could remove the tumor, also the cystic tumor part. The endoscopic inspection shows preservation of the stalk, and here was the attachment of the tumor. Visual improvement very rapidly, three months after surgery, looks good. He did not gain weight. He was. He had diabetes for almost eight weeks, but now it resolved, and he needs some replacement of some of the hormones. And type 4 is an intervicular tumor. Usually it's said that you should not make an endonasal approach for uh, purely intervicular tumors, but if you have a patient who has panhypopitis, patient presented with Edison crisis, was completely confused and has this lesion, you see severe edema around the tumor, and the tumor is within the third ventricle. But again, you see the wide distance between the gland and the chiasm here. So we said he's panhypopit, so we make an endonasal approach. And you see the stalk is almost completely destroyed. This is the stalk, and you see here only small fibers remaining, the peak cone on the left side, right side. The first step is internal evacuation with ultrasonic aspiration. And the cystic part comes easily out from the ventricle, and then we dissect the solar part. And again, you see there is a kind of biotic plane around the tumor, so we dissect in this plane. It was a little bit sticky to the chiasm. See branches of the superior hypophysial artery. This is a stalk. So initially I tried to preserve the stalk, but if you look closer, you see that there is no chance to preserve the stalk. Again, by manual dissection to avoid traction to the hypothalamus. So then here's the last piece was very sticky here to the chiasm and also to the stalk. And you see that it's a remnant of the stalk, and then of course there's no chance you just cut it. Because this patient is okay because he was already in pit. So we cut it proximally. And you see this is a distal stalk here. The distal stalk is cut. And then the tumor is totally removed. Three months post-op was good. Twelve months post-op, no recurrence, everything looks good. No obesity, was the same weight like before, visual field was good, but you see 32 months later he developed a recurrence, so we sent him again for fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy, and now is four years after the, uh, after the radiation, two months gone, it's not visible anymore. And he needs of course full replacement. So this is my series of 20 cases, four patient were recurrent cases, the stalk was sacrificed in three of them because they were already pan pit. But in the primary cases, we could preserve the stalk in seven, although we get a gross total resection, and four of these stalks were functionally intact. So it makes sense to preserve the stalk if the chance 
is there. <coughs> and we had two patients of obesity. I had to stop earlier in one lady, and one was a child, visual deterioration on one eye from 100% to 90%, so very mild visual acuity problem, visual field was okay, CSF leakage high rate, but all three cases were the three cases were in the initial phase where we had not a flap and we had uh, made some mistakes. In the last 12 cases we had just one CSF leakage and two of the earlier cases required a shunt to stop the leakage they presented with pre op hydrocephalus. That was really a problem. But as I said, this is a learning curve and now it's much better. And if you look at the literature about long-term results of fractionated radiotherapy, it's a very good control rate. 95% after 5 years, 92% after 10 years, and even after, uh, after 20 years, uh, we have a rate of 83%. So I think radiation is an option, and there are studies showing that the gross total resection is equally in the progression-free survival to subtotal resection with radiation, but with a better quality of life. This is data from a prospective trial in children in Germany. So my philosophy has changed. If the tumor presents, if the patient presents with pituitary insufficiency and the eye, of course, you can take the stalks, it's no problem. But if the patient is endocrinologically intact and the tumor can dissect it from the stalk, then I make a gross total resection. However, if I know that the resection will result in pituitary insufficiency with DI, I would not take the stalk, but send, make a subtotal resection with decompression of the optic nerve and send for radiotherapy. So my conclusion is, an onasal approach is preferred for most of the craniofarnal tumors, at least what we see in Germany. Advantages are early identification of the stalk, and sometimes partial resection is better than gross total resection. So I want to invite you to Orlando to the World Congress of Neuroendoscopy this November. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for